Hi, Calvary family. Thank you so much for joining us online today. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome. We are so happy you're here. If you want to connect with us further, you can check out our website at calvaryweb.net and you can find lots of information on the church and ways that you can connect with us further. If you would just like to join me as I read Psalms 30, 1 through 12. I will exalt you, Lord, for you have rescued me. You refuse to let my enemies triumph over me. O oh Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you restored my health. You brought me up from the grave, O oh Lord. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. When I was prosperous, I said, nothing can stop me now. Your favor, O oh Lord, made me as secure as a mountain. Then you turned away from me, and I was shattered. I cried out to you, O Lord. I begged the Lord for mercy, saying, What will you gain if I die, if I sink into the grave? Can my dust praise you? Can it tell you of your faithfulness? Hear me, Lord, and have mercy on me. Help me, O Lord. You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy, that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. You just join me as I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for letting us be able to gather together, Lord, even if it's um, in ways that we're not used to, whether it's through technology or in person. I just pray that you would meet us here this morning, that you would reveal yourself and your glory and your faithfulness to us in new and beautiful ways, and that you would allow us to feel the joy that you bring to us, Lord, and that we can only find in you. Amen.
Hey church, so last week we had the privilege of baptizing people in all three of our services. It was an amazing Sunday. Worship was just fantastic and it's so great to see 
this outward expression of what God is doing inside people's hearts. And here at Calvary, we don't believe baptism saves us, but we do believe that it is an outward sign of an inward change. And that something that we as believers do is uh, we follow Jesus in obedience. And so we have put together a video for you and we hope you just enjoy and are blessed by watching the baptisms. Bailey, why, why do you want to get baptized today? Because I'm just so ready for God to have my life. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love that, dude. Absolutely. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then based on your, your profession of faith and in obedience with the Lord's command, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk with him in the newness of life. Rick, why do you want to be baptized today? Well, the Lord has led me to a church where there's a presence of God. Awesome. So I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his death, raised to walk with him in the newness of life. On your confession of faith, me and your dad get to baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk with him in the newness of life. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk with him in the newness of life. Baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his death, raised to walk with him in the newness of life. Why do you want to be baptized today? Well, I was baptized as an infant, and that was their choice. This is my choice to honor God. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with him in his death, raised to walk with him in the newness of life. And based on your profession of faith and in obedience with the Lord's command, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk with him in the newness of life. Zachary, why do you want to get baptized today? Because I asked Jesus into my heart, and I want to show everybody that I love Jesus. Awesome, man. Upon your confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today in our Western culture, where do you get the opportunity to sing with other people? A school choir, maybe? Uh, a Christmas gathering? A concert? If you can hear each other over the music? Maybe the seventh inning stretch at a Cubs game or go Cubs go after a win? And hey, if you're a Sox or a Cardinals fan or an Indians fan, I'm so sorry about that. And, and I'm so sorry that you don't have a cool song to sing to when your team wins. Anyway, Christians are singing people. Christians are singing people. Muslims. Hindus, Buddhists, like they don't gather together to sing. Christians do. Christians do. We sing to him, we sing about him, and we sing for him. 
Believers gather together to sing because it's what we've been created to do and it's what we've been redeemed and rescued to do. It's, it's what we've been called and invited to do. We've been called out and invited to sing. And that's not my opinion, by the way. We're not here for what I think this morning. I, I remember this hitting me uh, a few years ago as I was digging through the Scriptures. And, you know, you see this all over, all throughout the Scripture. First Samuel 2, God rescues Hannah uh, from her barrenness. And what does she do? She sings to the Lord. Um, Second Samuel 22, just a few, uh, another book later, a few chapters later, David sings after he's rescued from his enemies. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth. Blessed be the rock, the God of my salvation. Right? I mean, he sings. Luke 1, um, an angel comes and tells Mary that she's going to be uh, the mother of the Savior, the Messiah who comes. What does she do? She sings to the Lord. God rescues a nation from bondage in Egypt. Moses and and the children of Israel, what do we read in Exodus 14, verse 31? When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him and in His servant Moses. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. They sang. In the New Testament, to the church, Paul uh, writes these words to the Colossian church. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you sing and admonish one another, as you teach and admonish one another, with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Again, you know, Paul to the church in Ephesus says this. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, you guys. And speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I heard a a leader say once that we've been called to sing because God means for us, created in His image, to do as He does. So are you telling me that God sings? Yeah, I'm telling you that God sings. Zephaniah 3, verse 17, out of the mouth of the prophet, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Would you let that register in your brain for a minute? That that if you grab onto God by confessing and believing that the sovereign infinite creator of the universe, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, in his love, he would rejoice over you with singing. That's amazing. Hebrews chapter 2, the writer of the Hebrews writes this, and bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Who, who's that? Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, right? The pioneer of our salvation through what he suffered. Listen, verse 11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. That's Jesus and us, right? So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. That's those who've grabbed onto him. Verse 12, he says, I will declare your name, whose name? That's the Father's name. I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. Wow. You ever notice that? Jesus, the Son of God, singing the praises of God the Father, declaring to his brothers and sisters how incredible and awesome his Father is. It's an expression of the relationship of love and and satisfaction, perfect love and satisfaction that has existed within the Trinity since before time began. And we've been created in His image, and we've been invited in to experience and to enjoy that kind of relationship with our Creator. So I get it, singing loudly in the presence of other people can be a bit awkward, uh, or at least not normal for many of us who have grown up here in the West. The first time that I visited a rural church out in a township in South Africa, I quickly discovered how wonderfully they sang. They sing. No instruments, uh, no microphones, many hands are clapping, and how they all together joined their voices in full-throated praise. I could hear them down the road as we rolled up to the property. As Westerners, uh, we're more accustomed to listening to professional quality and performance-oriented music. 
And for better or for worse, that affects what people like you and me expect when we walk into the church gathering. If you have a Bible, go ahead and get to Psalm 150, or you can jump on the Calvary app, or, or you can follow along on the screens. Kids, you can write this down on, on your kids' notes if you're following along today, if you're joining us. Psalm, the book is Psalm, uh, rather it's uh, chapter 150, and uh, the verses we're going to look at are 1 through 6. As you do that today, uh, I'm going to make sure that we're on the same page in regards to where we're, go- we're, where we're digging into this morning. Okay? Not everybody grew up in Sunday school or knows what a psalm is, so let's, let's uh, talk about this real quickly. The psalms in the Bible are a collection of 150 poems, songs, and prayers that were written mainly by the poets and the, mus- the musicians who worked in the temple. But the Psalms are not simply a hymn book either. You, you see, these Psalms were accumulated throughout Israel's history as a nation. But in the days following their exile into Babylon, the Psalms were compiled and they were intentionally arranged. They were uniquely designed. The Psalms are divided into five books. The first three of them are filled with Psalms of lament. And you hear the pain and the, the confusion and the anger and the frustration about how jacked up this world is, they often draw attention to what's wrong in the world and they ask God to do something about it. But then the last two books of the Psalms are filled with Psalms of praise. And they begin to transition our attention to what's good in the world. They retell the stories of the gracious things that God has done and, and in and around the lives of his people and they celebrate what he's done and what he will do. And so today, here we find ourselves at the very end of the Psalms And uh, uh, these last five at the end are sort of a crescendo. Each of them begin with hallelujah, right? This is praise Yahweh. In your Bible, it reads praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You can see this starting in Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Psalm 147, praise the Lord. How good is it to sing praises to our God? How pleasant and fitting to praise him. Psalm 148, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights above, praise him all the angels, praise him all his heavenly hosts, praise him sun and moon, praise him all you shining stars, praise him you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Psalm 149, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. And then here we find ourselves today in Psalm 150, the last of the Psalms. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Right? Now, now, why is there this shift in the Psalms from lament to praise? Why is that such a big deal? Is there intention in that? Is there significance in that design? Absolutely. You see, as you and I hope for Jesus to return and finish what he started. As you strive to trust him and to walk in his ways until that day, here's what he said is going to happen. Here's what we said is going to happen earlier this summer. It's going to create tension for you because when you look around, you'll notice the tragic state of our world, the anger and the injustice and the violence and the poverty and the selfishness and the pride of men the marginalized and the oppressed. And and when you quiet yourself and you look in here, you're going to become tragically aware that there is residue of the same selfishness, the same rebellion, the same evil that exists in your own heart. So the Psalms were compiled and designed to teach you a few things. First, uh, that you wouldn't just ignore the pain in your life, the trials and the brokenness. Don't just throw your hands up or give in or, or blame God. You don't have to curl up in a fetal position in the corner. You've got to be able to grieve. Life sucks sometimes, and it seems unfair. And people will just hurt you and disappoint you, intentionally or unintentionally. And and your own weakness, your own broken tendencies can just frustrate the heck out of you. And you've got to be able to be honest about those things and grieve over them. 
But at the same time, number two, if Yahweh is your God, Faith in the God of the Bible is forward-looking. I mean, you look around and you look in here, but then you look forward with confidence and assurance to the promise of Emmanuel. God will always be with you. God will never forsake you. You look forward to the promise of God's future kingdom when the Messiah brings heaven back to earth completely and restores our relationship with God and everyone who has grabbed onto Jesus by faith. There will be a day where there will be no more tears and no more shame. And that forward-looking hope will affect how you're able to grieve when you're in the valley. But not only that, it should affect how you live today, how you find contentment and and joy and peace in the middle of a a busted-up world. And it should affect how you're able to love and reflect the grace of God to others. But here's one more thing the Psalms were compiled and designed to teach us. And this is what I'd like to spend some time talking about today. Number three, there is power unleashed when God's people sing. There's power unleashed when God's people sing. I can hear you again. Some of you are thinking, hey, isn't singing like a a secondary issue? Like, why in the world are we talking about singing when everywhere we look right now, we see fear and anxiety and injustice and poverty and broken systems and broken people? This world seems pretty dark right now, and shouldn't we be people who are getting in the fight and, and, and serving the least of these and stepping into dark places to care for people and, and to learn to be generous? And How about we learn to evangelize? But, but today it's sing? Are you serious? Yeah, dead serious. Sing. And, and hey, cards on the table, my hope for you, for you and for me, is that by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would be able to grow in our capacity and in our delight in singing songs to God and to each other. So off we go. Lord, help us this morning. We all know that there's something about singing that, humanly speaking, is profound and powerful. Social scientists have been saying it like this for years. Music does something to human beings physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We as human beings need to, love to, be around music and singing at some level in our lives. It's certainly clear that it's a common grace that God has given to all of mankind to enjoy. But the scriptures would seem to say that it's a special gift that he's given to his people for our joy, for our good, and for his glory. Why would God mention singing over 400 times in the Bible? Why does he call us and invite us into this like more than 50 times? Do do you think that it's because, you know, he's having a tough time and that he needs to be encouraged? Like, like, man, this COVID thing and this this racial tension and the the upcoming election, it's just just got me so down right now. I need someone to, to say something good about me and put it to a nice beat so that I can feel better about myself. Like, is that why he's inviting us to sing? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know how good you are at singing. Some of you are amazing, but you know maybe you sing alone because you don't like to be put yourself in a place of attention. Others of you are terrible, but you know you don't give a rip. You sing at the top of your lungs, right? Your spouse is nudging you repeatedly to quiet down, and you're just going for it, right? I've heard some of you participating uh, in our services online that it's awkward for you to sing at home, and and you know others of you are just like belting it out out there. I know you're you're either and here's here's who you are. If you're belting it out, you're either alone or you're over 40, right? Because if you're over 40, like you've given up on trying to impress anybody, especially your kids, right? You can't be embarrassed anymore. Wherever you are, uh, we know that we're all over the place when it comes to our abilities to sing. And, And maybe it's not your strength, but over 50 times we hear God say, sing, sing. And he's not saying it because he needs it, okay? So so what's the deal then? Well, the deal is there's power, there's spiritual power that is unleashed when God's people sing. And I've got four points on this 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 week, okay? Four points. First is this, the, the power to unite, okay? The power to unite. Nearly everyone agrees that the power of music is undeniable and it has the power to bring people together. Sociologists, psychologists, they've researched it and written about it at length. Music has the power to connect people and to bring us closer in relationship with each other. People made in the image of God. That doesn't happen with animals, by the way. You play them music all you want, right? We touched on this last week. 
that we, Calvary Church, are people from all walks of life, and despite our differences, despite our immaturities, our preferences on things that are non-essential to salvation, no matter where we're at on this journey of faith, as we respond together in praise, our hearts are knitted together around a common bond. And the common bond is this. We have the answer to our greatest longing, our greatest treasure, our only hope, our deepest joy, our greatest Meaning and purpose in life is found in the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And singing has the power to unite God's people around the gospel and the implications of the gospel. Unfortunately, it has also been a force to rip apart local congregations. Whatever thoughts you have on the role of singing in corporate worship, they're probably passionate ones. You see, because in your gut, you know that singing is powerful and that it matters. I became a Christian in the middle of the worship wars. And some of you may uh, not know what that is, but uh, how many of you guys lived through those, right? In the, in the 1970s, a revival broke out in California called the Jesus Movement. And, and Nita uh, talked about this a little bit last week or a couple weeks ago. Uh, a bunch of sandal-wearing, uh, long-haired hippies caught Jesus and started sharing the gospel. Some of them joined Calvary chapels. Others planted a new series of churches called the, the Vineyard Churches. And they ended up ushering in this new style of worship, uh, worship singing. All the churches, or all these choruses started to be written and started making their way across the U.S. And so churches for the first time had to wrestle with what to do with their hymn books, Right? Uh, like, what's the right thing to sing? Should we stick to these hymns or, or should we start singing these new contemporary choruses? And this led to the great worship wars of the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. Churches started to go, well, our contemporary service is at 10 and our traditional service is at 815 and, and churches began to split over this. And I showed up at Calvary in 99 and it was going on here. And Christy and I are falling in love with Jesus and our church is like, our church grew from like 300 to 200 right? Because of the worship war. And we're going like, what's happening? Where's everybody going? Do you remember those times? Maybe you do. That was a unique season in the life of the American church where I think there was a revival going on in terms of how we think about and how we interact with the truth of God's word and respond to those realities in our singing, okay? God's given us hymns and God's given us new songs to sing. And singing has the power to unite people around the gospel and the implications of the gospel. And we all have our preferences, and Jesus taught us to lay them down for the sake of others. When God's people sing with hearts that are focused on the grace of God in Jesus Christ, our hearts are going to be knit together and we're going to flourish together. The power to unite. Second, though, is this. The power to remember. The power to remember. Maybe the most fascinating thing about the power of song is how it can bring back memories from the past as if they happened only yesterday. You guys, I could say something meaningful this morning and you're, you know, amen, brother, preach it, or, oh man, you're so right, I'm going to do that. And then five minutes after you walk out of this room or, or, you, or you turn off the TV, uh, your device, you know how it goes down. You're like, what did he say again? Isn't that how it goes down? Like most of the time? Like how, how many of you guys know what it's like though? to hear a song, and it has the power to take you back, right? In your mind, in your emotions, to a moment, to a season, to a place, a person, a feeling. I mean, we've all had those instances where we're driving in the car, and the song takes us right back to being six years old again and riding in the truck with our dad. Or, or those emotions of being at that dance in junior high, or what it felt like when you were hanging out with your friends that summer before your senior year of high school. They come flooding back, right? There are powerful memory cues in music and lyrics that flip a switch in our minds. And sometimes it can open us up to emotions that are precious or overwhelming. Sometimes the tears come. Sometimes you do it on purpose because it's just what you need. Science may not have figured out time travel yet, but listening to that song comes pretty close. Why is it so important for us as Christians to remember, right? Isn't it because we have the tendency to forget so easily? And isn't it because our default mode is to drift from what we know to be true about God and how awesome and incredible he is? To get distracted and to lose perspective? And don't we need to be reminded all the time? Don't we need to be taken back? I'm pretty sure that's why C.S. Lewis said in his book, 
mere Christianity that people need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. He's so right. Listen, singing is a form of articulating our theology. And it has the power to catechize us or to to lock these truths into our memory. We need reminded because we need to know what God's like and what what he's promised in those moments that we failed or or in those those darkest moments of our life. We need to know who we are and, and our value and our worth and what we're breathing for and why we get to take another breath. And we need hope in the middle of a scary and busted up world. We need comfort and we... And we don't just need to know it, okay? More on this in a minute, but we need the truth in our head to sink into our gut, okay? We need those truths to get down deep into our souls and, and, and to come back up when we go through difficult circumstances. That's the power of song. It can begin to shape you and settle you at a deeper level than simply your mind understanding something to be true. That power is unleashed when God's people sing. The power to unite, the power to remember Third, the power to confront. The power to confront the real you on the inside. Okay, So the book of Exodus in the Old Testament details the story of how God used a man named Moses to rescue his people out of a brutal life of slavery and bondage in Egypt. In response, they spend their days grumbling against God, rejecting him and Moses with discontented, ungrateful, complaining, and rebellious attitudes. Okay? God puts them in a 40-year timeout, remember, right? Like, until that generation faces the consequences of their sin, they live their life, and they die in the wilderness. Fast forward to the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is, is, again, ready to take God's people into the promised land, and this time the children have grown, and God says, I know them. They're just as rebellious and stiff-necked as their parents. And before I even get them into the land, they're going to turn against me, and so here's what I'm going to do. Listen to this carefully. Deuteronomy 31, verse 21. This is in the ESV. It reads, When many evils and troubles have come upon them, in other words, you know, as they live in this sinful or this broken world and as they deal with their own selfish hearts and the consequences of their own sinfulness, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. So Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the people. Did you catch that? God plans to confront his people in their rebellion with a song. A song that he puts into their brain and into their heart, that he puts into the hearts of their kids that they won't be able to forget. And and you got to get this. He lovingly confronts them with grace and compassion and warning with a song. What does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with us, you ask? That's a great question. And here's how that plays out for you and me, okay? When the people of God come together, live or online, and and we give ourselves over to joyful praise, to do what we were created and redeemed to do, to see and to savor how incredible and awesome God is, you may be resisting that for a variety of reasons, okay? Would you not agree that, that some of us are stuck in a ditch right now? Okay? Some of us are distracted from trusting God and walking in his way. Okay? Some of us are in the path of rebellion. Some of us are sideways with a relationship that we should be seeking to make right. Some of us are about to step into something that we know will wreck our marriage or our family. Some of us are doubting God's goodness. Some of us are battling, battling addictions or anxieties that are taking us under. Some of us are choosing to walk in a pattern that we want to walk in, even though we know that God has said, and guess what? In God's grace and in his kindness, he lovingly confronts you, convicts you, and comforts you with his glory, his grace, his compassion, his his warning with a song with a song, a song of praise that cuts to your heart, to your emotions, to your affections. A song that levels you with the reality of how awesome he is. How ridiculous and undeserved his love is for you. How far he's gone to rescue you from the curse of sin. And how he has set you free to walk in his ways that you would reflect his love and grace to your spouse, to your children, to your neighbor, and to your enemy. Kids, this is one of those spots on your, on your kid notes. What should I remember? If I could boil it down, I would say it like this. Remember this. 
Singing truth about God has the power to change the real you on the inside. And I'm talking about it can change what you think and what you feel and what you want. This is one of the ways that God loves his people. Okay? This is why it's incredibly powerful to gather with God's people and joyfully sing. Because depending on the day or the season, those of us who are struggling, those of us who are stuck on a roundabout of stupidity, maybe we're chasing one of our functional saviors, hoping to find significance or security or happiness from some created thing or person, we're going to hear the praise, we're going to see the words that we're singing, and we're going to be confronted, convicted, and comforted. Corporate singing, praying, preaching, confession of sins, responsive reading, engaging in these expressions of worship together is uniquely powerful. Our hearts are confronted with the gospel and the implications of the gospel. Affections are awakened that we haven't brought in with us into the service. We're convicted and we're stirred up to repentance and our spiritual battery is recharged over and over again on this journey of faith. Of course, God shows up in those one-on-one moments, those you and yourself you know, with him moments. But, but on the whole, I would say that my most moving and life-changing moments of communion with God have been in corporate worship. Here's an example. There are many times on Sunday mornings that I find myself uh, just singing. I'm just going through the motions because that's what happens very often, right? It doesn't always click until my eyes glance over and I see my brother, Ed, my sister, Phyllis, like this. And here's what happens. Knowing what I know about Ed and Phyllis, knowing what I know about what Ed and Phyllis have walked through in this life, knowing everything that I've been through with them, when I see them, I could say this about many of you, when I see them engaged in authentic, passionate, expectant praise to the God who gives and takes away, that is like an arrow gets shot through my heart and through my soul. And and this happens repeatedly in corporate worship. There is power unleashed when God's people sing. Me being near someone who is engaged with God is convicting. They're not putting on a show. They're just authentically engaged with God, loving God. And when you're not, when you see that, that's good for you. That's just good for your soul. When God confronts my heart like that with the reality of his goodness and his faithfulness and how he's walked with us through the valley of the shadow of death and he's proven that his grace is sufficient, that his mercies are new every morning, that he always keeps his promises, that there's no greater comfort or hope in this life, standing next to you, I'm telling you, those are the sweetest times of worship in my life, more intense and glorious than ever. And there are still songs that I can't even get the words out of my throat because of the glorious truths that I know in my head are sinking down into my soul again. How about this one? Christy and I have been married for 21 years, and we've been through just about everything that people who have been married for 21 years go through together. Walked through deep waters together, trying to love each other better. Fights and struggles and ugliness and selfishness and kid problems and health issues and financial issues and midlife crisis issues and relational damage, hurt, frustration, counseling. We've been sitting in here pretty much every Sunday for 20 years. And I've been a pastor here for 13 years. And whether I'm about to lead back in Calvary Kids or counsel someone or teach or preach or whatever, what do you do when it's been one of those weeks? What about when it's been the worst week of your marriage or or a terrible week of parenting? What do you do? How how do you carry on? How do you sing? How do you praise? How do you worship? How do you serve and not be a hypocrite? I can't tell you how many times over the years, as I'm singing, as I'm singing some beautiful expression of God's mercy, God's grace, the truth of God's word has broke over me with such conviction of my selfishness and has caused my soul to repent. I would ask you, brother, sister, where do you get the strength to just humble yourself and say, I was wrong, I'm sorry? Or where where do you get the strength to seek the Lord for his mercy, 
to, to lead in going to the other person and making peace and forgiving and demonstrating the love of Christ to your spouse, to your friend, to your parent, to your kids, whoever it is. There is power that is unleashed when God's people sing. The power to unite, the power to remember, the power to confront the real you on the inside. It's unleashed when God's people sing. What else? Last one, number four, the the power to make you whole. The power to make you whole. Here's the thing. Many of you came out of the womb and you're type A. So that means you probably cut your own umbilical cord and gave a lecture on how to come out of the birth canal before you left the hospital, right? Like you're the type of person who, you know, likes order. You're all about function and efficiency and you like to get things done and you probably hate that we sing as much as we do. Like, like, you're like, can we get to the word, bro? Like, let's get to the, the book. I didn't come here to sing the same chorus five times. I came here to hear you exegete that text, right? And yet, you got to know that there are others of you. And, <laughs> and what I would hear from you is, man, you got to cut that sermon to 20 minutes and add four songs. Isn't that right? Like, like, some of you would just love it if we sang one song, and others of you are like, someone needs to cut Josh off so we can enjoy the Lord together. Like, like let me just say, no matter how you're wired, there's no better. It's just different. Okay? It's not always bad to be more rigid and structured. It's not, always, it's not all bad to, to be more of a feeler and easier carried by emotion. They just present different challenges that we should be aware of. So here's the thing. For every one of us, when we open our mouth and sing, it's hard to remain emotionally disengaged. Maybe that's what some of you are afraid of. Jonathan Edwards proposed that the reason God has called and invited us to sing is wholly to excite and to express religious affections. In other words, singing is one of the most powerful means of grace by which God's people grab hold of his word and align their emotions and their affections to God's. Okay? Singing has the power to make us whole or full or mature. It's designed to bring together what's in our head and what's in our heart. Okay? The point is that our heart would be moved by what we would agree is true and awesome. That we, that we would move out of the realm of a faith that is simply known into the realm of a faith that is experienced and enjoyed. And kids, this is another one of those spots on your sheets. What does this mean for me? Well, it means this. Singing truth about God is supposed to make you feel things. It's supposed to make you feel things. Sorrow, thankfulness, joy, excitement. Hope, love, it's okay to feel and to express those things. So let me talk to the Stoic people first, those of us who are less likely to be carried by emotion. And you may be like, well, my heart doesn't get moved by this stuff to the point where I'm not going to sing, I'm not going to praise, I'm not going to get emotional or lift my hands or something. And yet, let somebody come over to your house during the Super Bowl, or or better yet, let, let me sit next to you at your favorite Sporting event, your favorite team's sporting event. Explain to me how you get emotional at that experience, right? Like, let me roll with you to a a Coldplay or a Chris Stapleton concert, right? And yet, somehow you can remain more stoic and meek and contained when you gather with your blood-bought brothers and sisters that you're going to get to hang out with forever, by the way, and as we remind each other of how deep a mercy that God's demonstrated to us. I'm just saying, don't you think that that should move you emotionally? Like, God's asked you to raise your hands. God's asked you to sing. He's asked you to dance, to, to sing loud. It's an act of obedience. And it's, I'm telling you, take a step. I guarantee you, you take a step, God will meet you there. You'll never be sorry for that. When we see the Lord someday in glory, when we see the Lord someday in glory, I don't care what your temperament is, Okay. <laughs> You're going to be undone and overwhelmed before him. But what about the feelers? What about the feelers? Those of us who are more apt to be carried by emotion. Feelers are going to be more comfortable being, you know, more expressive and totally more comfortable with poetic license in our songs than than the structured type A concrete thinkers. And this is where we're seriously going to need to chill out and give each other some grace. Okay? Uh, You know as well as I do, that you can lift your hands and clap and sing loud and be far from God, okay? Expressing your joy in worship isn't about showmanship. It isn't about seeking attention or just making a show of things. 
Simply being expressive doesn't make you a mature Christian. Okay? On the same hand, I just don't think God's ever going to say, hey, whoa, 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 calm down. I'm not that big of a deal. Like, relax, save it for the bears. You know, they're, they're far more glorious than me. Come on. Like, if you're rolling around on the floor or if you're bringing your own instrument or if you're knocking people around during worship, yeah, you might have a problem, okay? But, but let me say this again. Singing is meant to make us whole or full or mature, okay? It's intended to bring together what's in our head and what's in our heart, which also means this, that we're not gonna be comfortable singing heresy, okay? We're not gonna be comfortable singing heresy. We can't just be good, you know, good with, well, you know, I, I don't care what the words are teaching, but I like the melody. No, 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 no. We've got to be serious about singing lyrics that express true perceptions of the realities of who God is and what he's done and what he's promised and who we are and what he's called us to and what he's invited us and equipping us to be. And honestly, my prayer for you is that singing the truths and the implications of the gospel would become a more significant part of your life. In your car, with your family, at home, over your kids, with your small group, and on Sundays with your church family, live or online. There is power that is unleashed when God's people sing. You know, I I love me some classic rock, and, and I love me some 90s country and Johnny Cash, but you know, but what I find is that I need a balance in my life. And if I'm feeding myself a steady diet of popular music, there's something not happening in my soul. Let me say that again. If I'm feeding myself a steady diet of popular music, there's something not happening in my soul. Okay? And I'm going to find myself depleted, discouraged, more easily tempted, reacting sinfully, and just on E spiritually. And and, and I get it, you guys. I know that there's just a lot of Christian music that's cheesy and crappy and produced by people who aren't even following Jesus, okay? But here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is singing praise is a weapon. Singing praise is a weapon. Sing the truths that have the power to reach in and confront your heart, okay? That have the power to teach and to shape the way that you view God, the way that you're able to see yourself, the way that you're able to love others, And guess what? The darkness will flee. You watch the darkness flee. Would you pray with me this morning? Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we, we confess that we are in bondage to the deceitfulness of sin and cannot free ourselves without your power at work in us. And we have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. And we have not loved you with our whole heart, nor, we, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray that you would have mercy on us. We believe your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord Jesus, give us an increasing freedom from sinful desires and give us the joy and the power of loving the things that you love and walking in your ways and reflecting your grace to the people that you've put in our lives. Holy Spirit, would you shape us into a people who just get fired up to praise the greatness of our God. We ask this for our good and for the glory of your beautiful and awesome name. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies There is a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief There is a hallelujah Hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roll Love from the ashes Open your eyes Death is
Thank you so much for worshiping online with us today. I just want to thank you so much for your continued faithfulness in tuning into worship and your continued faithfulness in your giving. It allows us to continue to be the church God's called us to be. If you're looking for ways to give, you can go to calvaryweb.net slash give, or you can even give via text 84321. Thank you so much. Have an awesome day. Go with God.